Now our last speaker, Melissa Clark Reynolds, I read your CV and it's very hard to summarise but I'm going to have a quick go. Officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit, First Independent Director of Beef and Lamb New Zealand, a digital strategist, Governor of Radio New Zealand, sits on a number of boards, study disruptive innovation and keeps bees. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Oh, mihi no kia koutou. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, it was funny because I was thinking down the back, like I'm, I'm wearing um, my wool suit, especially for you guys, because um, one of the things that made me laugh about this is that I, I like to sew and so I buy fabric online. And, um, and I saw this, this green fabric and so I bought it. And then when I got the little package, because I had to buy it out of the UK, I got a little package, and it came with this really beautiful little label explaining to me like where it had been grown and how it was, and um, I hadn't realised I had bought a pure Australian merino piece of wool. Um, so I'm just apologising for that in advance. Um, but, but what I would say is that, you know, one of the things, it's sort of easy for us to mock vegans, uh, Gerard, and, um, and I think as we do that, what we should remember is that we um, thought nylon was kind of a pile of crap and I want to put it on their floors. And um, when we thought about that, we didn't sit down and think, you know what, how could I beat those bastards? Right, And I think it's quite important because at the moment we're going through a phase where there is this growth in veganism and we're seeing a growth in what's called flexitarianism. So even more important than the growth of veganism actually is what's happening is that people are eating less meat than they used to if they're in that wealthier section of um, society. And what they're doing, and, and it's the message I think we need to get across loud and clear to them, is if you're going to eat less meat, eat better meat. And then what we need to be thinking about is what does better meat look like? And better meat does look a lot like what First Light's doing. Um, but I want us to think about, like, we've already been through a phase once before where we lost out because we mocked them rather than thought about how we're going to beat you guys. And not only that, what I'm seeing at the moment, and, like, my Twitter stream is absolutely full of it yesterday, um, when I, I called out, I saw a New Zealand oat company making oat milk, and I was like, that is awesome. These guys are f a New Zealand farmers producing a New Zealand product. And I got absolutely slaughtered on Twitter for daring to call it milk. And I just want to get across that's the same as the mocking thing. Um, if we kind of want to like, make our customers feel bad somehow or our potential customers feel bad, they're not going to want to join us. And yet what we've really got to do is follow those kinds of steps that Gerard set out and think about how could we really produce like, the world's most delicious food that they, other people just want to eat. So I'm going to talk about how fast change happens, and I love that quote about ideas having sex with each other, right? Um, and so this is, um, this is 1900 in New York. This is the weirdo idiot that bought the first car. And everybody around him mocked him, right? Because he was clearly an idiot because everybody else had horses and carts and all of the um, apartment blocks in Manhattan back then had stables downstairs. And like he was such an idiot that he had to take a horse and cart down to the wharf to pick up petrol. Right? I'm serious. And I was reading an article about this, and the, the urban planners um, in Manhattan said Manhattan will never be fully built out because there's not enough horses to move the building materials. And they had these sort of pronouncements about the future. And this car thing was never going to take on because not only was it noisy, but it just wasn't economic, right? It was, a, it was a play thing. And I want you to kind of think about that a bit because change can happen quite fast when we're not looking. And what we think is normal now was never normal before. Um, but like I went to a hangi yesterday and, um, and they were telling me about traditional foods and they served brisket. And I was thinking, I don't know how much traditional brisket there was. It was bloody delicious, I just want to say. But, you know, I thought, well, these things change really, really fast. So I want, um, I'm a technologist. That ONZM I got was for services to technology. So my kids laugh. They go, you got a certificate from the Queen to say you really are a nerd. Um, so it's true. And so, you know, when I first went on email, um, 
it was really expensive, it came down in price, and um, these guys, AOL, were my first sort of thirty nine ninety five. I could um, get as many emails a month as I wanted, and the, um, the board of AOL started to see their revenue going down and didn't know what was happening, and these guys were happening to them, which is Google, and some of you all have Gmail accounts. I had one of the first Gmail accounts, and at the beginning you had to be invited in, because their technology was so bad, they would only let you join if you knew someone who already joined. And it wasn't, you know, they were trying to get to mass market, but they were having to slow their growth down because it wasn't very good. Um, and what you can see here is that by 2009, they're making $16 billion, but they were making it 10 cents a time out of ads. Whereas the previous guys back here, they were making their, you know, $1.5 billion um, all out of subscription revenue. And they didn't think an ad revenue would work. Um, and I, I kind of going to do a couple more. I'm going to be the mathy nerdy one, and then I'm going to put my, my numbers away. But one of the really important things to understand is that over the last sort of 40 years, the price of food relative to income has dropped quite markedly. And if we looked at that, um, I was interested in the ag research video. It talked about both um, farmers that were supplying commodity products and also high end. I think one of the real difficulties we've got in New Zealand is if we want to provide commodity products, we have to understand that we will continue to race to the bottom. So the more that we think about that productivity that um, Tom was talking about as a way to produce cheaper products, we will end up racing to the bottom because cheaper products end up always driving further and further down to the bottom of the market. And what we need to be thinking about is how can we res reverse this curve a bit like Google did? How do we make this a curve up? And there are a couple of things that have made this curve do a few bounces. And one of them is um, all of those, like, my food bag type boxes that have gone into people's homes have actually increased the amount of money that people are spending on food. Which is kind of interesting. It wasn't probably their intention, but it's the way that it's worked out. So there are some models that can show that people will spend more. And as well, we know that um, people will spend more as they, earn, oops, as they earn more. They're willing to spend more of their money on food. Um, so another quick curve, but this is the cost of energy in the US. It's plummeting for solar. Um, and this is what solar power, um, solar voltaics, the price of them, has been doing this really fast downward curve. This has got quite big implications um, for people who run businesses that are indoors. Okay? And I want you to think about that because part of what we have is we have a massive outdoor advantage. But that outdoor advantage may not last in all of our industries. And so this is a roof that's provided by um, Tesla. The last week they released their third um, generation of this. This roof is a power station. It produces more energy than this home would ever use. And we've got to a point now where photovoltaics, it's cheaper to install and run a solar-powered um, power station than it is to run a coal-fired power station. Get that? So to install and run a solar is now cheaper than running coal. This has got massive implications again, and you can see why Trump in the US is now putting subsidies onto coal, because these coal-fired power stations in the US are worth almost nothing, but they're on a lot of banks' balance sheets, and they're on a lot of companies' assets' um, registers. So if they're not worth anything, that has a big implication. And this will do more for climate change than probably anything else. But we still have quite a dependence on coal in our dairy industry in New Zealand. And when you can see what's going to happen is that the dairy industry internationally is going to move to solar really, really fast, and we're going to be stuck with coal for quite some time because that's what we've invested in. So we just need to understand that that commodity business can turn on a dime. And if their energy costs go to zero, which is where it's going, that means that if we're in commodity areas, we have to continue to work out how to push our costs down to zero. And I just want to like, have those as a warning. Um, so this is a, a vertical farm. Um, I went and visited another one in San Francisco a few weeks ago. Their power is nothing, right? They run it off solar power on the roof. Um, their rent is almost nothing. They produce vegetables for um, high-end restaurants in the US. They're certified organic. And one of the guys, his father is a vegetable farmer, and he said to me, you know, my dad, he got 40 seasons to get his farm systems right. I've done 40 seasons in my first year in business. 
And so he gets 40 turns a year, basically, in order to get the combination of genetics, soil, water, light, temperature right. And so his ability to learn really, really fast and have an exponential um, explosion in the productivity of that business is happening really quickly. And so when I talked about the difference between indoors and outdoors, the ability to produce vegetables at source and they cut them and they walk them to the market and their business model is that they sell them before they grow them. So a restaurant will go, yep, I want uh, 40 kilos of radicchio, I want 40 kilos of basil and, um, and I'll have 100 kilos of strawberries and I want them all in like X weeks. They pay for them then and then they're grown to order. And so this business model is very different than the way we currently operate here. Some of you will have seen the Impossible Burger. This is mine. I took a bite out of it. Uh, the vegan who was sitting next to me wouldn't try it because she thought it really did have meat in it. What to me is interesting here is that what we're seeing is that we know that in the Western world people eat too much meat. And what we know in the US is they eat roughly 10 times what is considered to be healthy. And in New Zealand we eat two to three times what is considered to be healthy. And so I'm a fan of the meat industry, I'm a member of the meat industry. My very, very first job was actually on a Savaloy line. Uh, may have put me off them slightly. Um, but um, my kids still got them for their birthday parties, I can assure you. Uh, but what's interesting here is that this growth of um, these kind of alternate meats, these are not aimed at vegans. These are aimed at meat eaters. Um, they are aimed at meat eaters who want to reduce their meat consumption but still have the mouthfeel and smell and flavour of meat. And so we're not talking here really about a rise in veganism. What we're talking about is we're talking about this flexitarianism. We've only seen a 3% increase in people becoming vegans, but we've seen about a 30% increase in people saying that they want to put more vegetables in their diet, and they believe that doing this does that. Um, I'm going to just jump through to a couple of things quite quickly. So one of the things I'm really interested in is like taking that supply chain um, work that First Light's doing and taking it even further. 2016, as a geek, was the year that we lost the internet. It was the year that bots, um, machines started talking to each other more than humans. So I don't know if you knew got a Fitbit. Google bought Fitbit last night, which I think is really interesting. Um, so Fitbit's probably the most common like, piece of technology in the world that people have that talk to other bits of technology. So this is a fridge that is um, integrated with Amazon. So if you put your meat into that fridge, you take it out. If you don't put it back in, it drops the exact order into the Amazon shopping cart, which means the power of branding is more important now than ever before because it doesn't drop meat in, it drops the actual product that you bought. And so what we're also seeing here is Whirlpool has um, launched an oven which does almost the same thing, integrates with an app, and the oven integrates with the Amazon shopping cart, tells Amazon what to buy in order for the recipe to be cooked. Um, once it's in the fridge, what it knows how to do is you put it in your oven. I know, but this is great for me as a working mum, I can tell you, because what I can do is I can put the recipe together, I can put it in the oven in the morning. I can, in the old oven, I could tell it when to start, but now I can do it off my phone. If I'm stuck in traffic on the way home or Air New Zealand's delayed again, I can delay the start. I could tell it, oh gosh, I told you to cook and now you, I want you to hold it for me. And if I liked that recipe, I can tick it, and then the recipe app will continue to just order that food until I tell it not to. So our supply chains are starting to change in really interesting ways. Um, we're seeing more and more farmers go direct where they're building their own meat boxes and selling those direct to consumer either on a one-off or on a subscription model. Um, we're seeing these subscription models in pretty much every industry. I'm just going to run through quickly to this last bit, which is that um, some of you may have seen the Rethink X report that came out a few weeks ago. Um, interestingly, it arrived in my inbox the same day as the Aussie Dairy Strategy. The Aussie Dairy Strategy is we're going to sell more dairy, we're going to double the value of dairy, and we're all going to make a lot more money. Um, doesn't really have anything else in it. Okay? Um, and then here, what this, that curves that I was talking about, the curve of um, fermented... Um, protein production is getting to a point where within the next 10 years a lot of people are saying that, um, that there will no longer be need for a cow to produce milk. What I think is really interesting in this one and where we should be paying attention is that the cost of casein and whey are likely to continue to increase over the next few years at the same time as the synthetic alternatives to casein and whey are dropping. 
So personally, I believe that um, there is a long-term future for milk and particularly for meat, um, but that we have to think quite carefully about what the attributes are that we're selling. And it comes back to those four points of Gerard's, actually. We need to know our consumer. We have to go after the um, consumer that was talked about at the beginning, the billionaires. If we go for a commodity market, we're going to be competing with the synthetics. We have to go for high end and we have to carve out a niche that says that, um, that we are a high quality natural product and we have to remember what the attributes of those are. But we will be competing against synthetic, particularly casein and whey, within the next five to ten years. So the last thing I just want to leave you with is this idea that we always overestimate what's going to happen in two and underestimate what's going to happen in ten. And the changes in the next ten years in the, um, in the animal protein market are going to be huge. And I think the biggest thing we have to remember is that we're in the food business and we have to think about how do we provide high quality food to people that is sexy, that's fun, that tastes good, uh, that is about beating around a dinner table together and that's where our point of difference is. And it only took 15 years for this to be what Manhattan looked like. And this is Easter 15 years later, and there were no more horses left. Thank you.